Well, grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the anointed one of God, and let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the day. We give you thanks and praise for the fact that, yes, you are great. You are great. And we've been lifting up our voices and praising you on this day, this resurrection morning, this day that we remember that the one who was buried three days ago has risen from the dead, never to die again. All glory, praise, honor, worship, majesty, adoration belongs to you, O God. We pray, Father. We pray, Holy Spirit. We, we pray, Jesus, our Lord, that the words of my mouth and the meditation of each and every one of our hearts today would be acceptable in your sight. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. Christ is risen. You may be seated. I'd like to read to you today the resurrection account from Mark's gospel. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might come and anoint him. Very early on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. They were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? Looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, although it was extremely large. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting at the right, wearing a white robe, and they were amazed. And he said to them, do not be amazed. You are looking for Jesus the Nazarene who has been crucified. He has risen. He is not here. Behold, here is the place where they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter, he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. They went out and fled from the tomb for trembling and astonishment had gripped them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Here ends the reading for today's meditation. Three days had passed since Jesus had been crucified and buried, and I have no doubt it was three days of unimaginable grief. Jesus had died. How in the world could that be? It is likely that questions would have plagued their hearts and minds, not only of these women, but everybody else as well. You know, hey, you know, had they followed Jesus in vain? Was he just a good man, even an amazing man? They thought he had been more. Now, however, there was work to be done. Jesus' body needed to be anointed. It was the Jewish custom. Already, Jesus' body had been in the tomb for three days. The anointing had to be done. It had to be done quickly be, before decay. And its accompanying stench really set in. As we know, the women got the surprise of their lives. Jesus was not dead. He was alive. He was no longer in the tomb. They went from unimaginable grief to unimaginable joy. Jesus had told his disciples three times in Mark's gospel. If you want to look it up, it's Mark 8, Mark 9, and Mark 10. Three times in Mark's Gospel, Jesus said he would die and that three days later he would rise from the dead. That word had not made sense to Jesus' disciples. And yet the fact that God's Holy One would not be abandoned to Sheol, nor would his body undergo decay, was prophesied in Psalm 16. Let's hear that prophecy. Psalm 16, 8 through 10. The psalmist writes, I have set the Lord continually before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. Christianity is the only worldwide belief Faith, religion, although I'm always reticent to call it a religion because it is not. But it's the only belief that can and does make the claim that its founder is alive. 
we can make this claim because it is true. Buddha is dead. Confucius is dead. Mohammed, founder of Islam, is dead. Joseph Smith, founder of Mormonism, is dead. Mary Baker Eddy, founder of Christian Science, is dead. Carl Taze Russell, founder of Jehovah's Witness, is dead. L. Ron Hubbard, founder of the Church of Scientology, is dead. Maharishi, Mahesh Yogi, founder of Transcendental Meditation, is dead. I could go on. In fact, I found an amazing list of different kinds of religions that have been founded by people, but except for the ones that are present-day foundings, all of the founders are dead. All of these people are dead, but Jesus lives. The messages of the people that I have listed and others who have founded religions but are now dead, their messages are nothing but empty words. But the message of Jesus Christ and him crucified, dead, buried, raised from the dead, never to die again, and ascended into heaven to sit at his Father's right hand is life. So you've got the empty words of all those other founders, but the word of life from the author of life himself. Jesus' words, it is living water for the thirsting soul. Pontius Pilate asked a question while Jesus stood before him at his trial, and Pontius Pilate's question was, what is truth? Jesus had just told him, everyone on the side of truth listens to me. To which Pilate said, what is truth? Pilate didn't know that the truth wasn't about facts and figures and that sort of thing. Truth is a person. And that person was standing right before him. Pilate could sentence Jesus to death. And he could have his soldiers carry out the sentence, but he could not keep Jesus in the tomb. He could not keep Jesus in the tomb because he could not keep the author of life in the tomb. You know, by Jesus, when he is raised from the dead, this is what it says. Life wins, death loses. Life wins, death loses. Today we remember Jesus' resurrection. Today is also the observation by Jews around the world of first fruits. First fruits. And uh, first fruits was appointed by God for his people to bring the first fruits of their harvest to the temple. By giving their first fruits to God, they were also trusting that God would bring more harvest in for them. The fact that Jesus was raised from the dead on first fruits is a fulfillment of the fact that he was to be the first fruit. The first fruit from the dead. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Paul writes, But now Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who are asleep. For since by man came death, by a man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ all will be made alive. But each in his own order. Christ the first fruits. After that, those who are Christ's at his coming. Jesus is the first fruits of those who are asleep. He is the first to rise from the dead. And he is by no means the last of those who are going to be rising from the dead. All people are going to rise from the dead. I hope you all know that. All people will rise from the dead. Some will rise to enjoy everlasting life with God and others everlasting life apart from God. Which is far worse than anyone can imagine. This takes me to the closing point. At the beginning, I read Mark's Gospel. And it ended up with these words, that the women went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had gripped them, and they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. These women said nothing. Nada. What are we going to do with what we have heard and seen. That's the question. Are we going to keep it to ourselves? Or are we going to share it? Amen.